I have two gentlemen here with me from Algonquin Books, Michael Takens and Craig Poplars. Uh, Craig Poplars, I want to read his bio first. Craig Poplars, a 1989 Appalachian State graduate of History and English. His first job out of college was, was with Sonico Products, was with Sonico Products Company. For Sonico, Craig was responsible for installing the first plastic grocery bags throughout grocery stores in the Southeast and the UK. Many of those plastic bags can still be seen today littering roadsides and tangled up in the high branches of trees on both sides of the Atlantic. Craig's publishing career began at the University of North Carolina Press, where he was paid a handsome starting salary of $15,000 a year for the role of customer service representative. In 1994, Craig joined Algonquin Books, where he now serves as the marketing director and human beatbox. Yep. Okay. <laughs> I know. It's on Google. He lives in Hillsboro with his wife and daughter and is a sucker for cycling, swimming, hiking, and Appalachian football. He prefers plastic over paper. Give a round. Thank you. Michael Takins. He is the publicity director at Algonquin Books, and he earned his MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop in 1996. He worked at UNC Press as an editorial assistant at Duke University Press as a publicist, and since 2000 has been working at Algonquin Books, where he is publicity director. His first book, the anthology Love is a Four-Letter Word, True Stories of Breakups, Bad Relationships, and Broken Hearts, with stories by Juno Diaz, Kate Christensen, Carrie Chetigart, um, Linda Berry, and 19 more, will be published by Penguin Plume on July 28th. Look out for that. Hey. All right, for our audience tonight, can you explain, Craig and Michael, the difference between a marketing director and a director of publicity. What kinds of things does each do? Absolutely not. We, we can't explain <laughs> that. We, we thought we were here for scrapbooking. Uh, so we apologize, so we're going to be winging it. Um, you want to go first? Sure. Um, well, I'll, I'll talk about what a publicist does. Um, a publicist works directly with uh, the media, and that includes um, print media, newspapers and magazines, broadcast media, radio and TV, and online media as well. Um, we also work closely with bookstores in setting up author tours. Um, we uh, create press materials. Um, essentially, we have a very close relationship with the media and try to land as much media attention as we possibly can for the books. On the marketing front, our job is to promote the books uh, into the stores and out of the stores. Uh, getting the galleys, which are preliminary copies of the novel or the, the nonfiction work, into the hands of our sales force and into the book selling community. Uh, some of the promotions are in-store promotions, like if you walk into uh, a lot of the big national chain stores and you see those big displays up front, those are actually bought placement um, in a lot of ways. So it's working with uh, Amazon.com, it's working with the independent booksellers, it's uh, coordinating a lot of the regional trade shows that take place across the country. Uh, any type of advertising or signage that you see in the store or national <coughs> advertising, uh, that's all sort of falls under the marketing realm. So. All right. Great. How many people here have read Water for Elephants? Yeah? Yeah? yeah. Okay. So um, that is a very big success story for Algonquin Books. And The Last Child in the Woods is another success story. So those two books are going to be one of the, are going to take our focus tonight. And so a little bit about Water for Elephants by Sarah Gruen. Um, Craig, how did you set up the logistics for getting the galleys for her book in as many independent bookstores as possible? And of course, Quail Ridge was, you know, could be counted as one of the independent bookstores that hand-sold Water for Elephants. So if you could take us through the process sure. there. Um, we, Michael and I have been with Algonquin for a very long time, and I think one of the advantages that we have working for a small house is the relationships that we have both with the media and with the booksellers across the country. I've been with Algonquin for... 15, going on 15 years now. And, and the relationships that we have with the independents are more or less friends. We, we know people in different parts of the country. We know what they read. We know their families. 
uh, it's not a cutthroat industry. It's a it's sort of a fraternity of uh, people that absolutely love books. So I, I think one of the first things that we did was when we had this book in our hands, we knew we had something special. We can get very excited in-house about it, uh, but sometimes we need uh, the booksellers to become barometers for us to okay. really take us down and, and make sure that what we have on our hands is legit. And so the first thing we did was, I believe we sent out uh, about 15 to 20 manuscripts to friends. I called them and I said, hey, would you mind taking a look at this? Let me know what you think. We're pretty excited, but I want a really good bead from you guys. And uh, and that was done prior to Christmas, and the book was coming out the 1st of June, I believe. Oh, and for those who don't know, Water for Elephants' uh, main protagonist is a young man who has just lost his parents, and it takes the setting is Depression-era 1930s and the circus, but there's another voice. There's um, the same man who was in his 30s is now modern day in his 90s, and so we have two points of views. Um, so that's, that's a story, and there's love, there's an elephant, there's conflict, and there's a circus um, where you're, you're going on. In those days, they traveled via train, so we have, we have a whole atmosphere. So just to give you an idea. Right. And it's, it's also been our hugest success. We've sold over two million copies now. It's been on the New York Times bestseller list for two solid years. Um, mm -hmm. So it's been a, a really huge book for us. Right. But I, I think in a lot of ways, uh, you know, those booksellers, they called and they were like, do you know what you have on your hands? And, and that's what started the excitement was uh, hearing their response. And a lot of them are, are friends that would say, you know, mm -mm, it's not what you think it is. But the, the amount of enthusiasm right out of the gate uh, was very, very impressive. And so when we sent the galleys out uh, between, I guess, Christmas and New Year's, mm -hmm. It was probably to about 400 booksellers around the country. And it included some of the, the praise and excitement from their, their uh, colleagues out in the bookselling field. So it wasn't me. That's, I think that's a wonderful thing about bookselling is at Algonquin, we're very small, but we feel we have a, an extended staff, more or less, of booksellers around the country that are out there waving the flag. So it just sort of escalated, and more and more booksellers read it. And, I think uh, the excitement and the marketing plans came together because okay. of their excitement. Great. So. What was it about the book that initially intrigued you? And I'm sure that what initially intrigued you also intrigued the, um, the independence. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you look at universi universality. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm curious as what, what made you think this is it? This is a great book. Do you want to answer? Um, it's just an amazing story. It's, um, it's, something that appeals to many different groups of people. Um, you pick it up and within the first five pages you're just immediately sucked in. Um, it's, you know, it's a, it, it's a very commercial novel. Mm -hmm. she's, she's a very successful writer, but it, it just had a lot of commercial elements to okay. it that a lot of the fiction that we publish, um, which is more literary, mm -hmm. you know, doesn't always appeal to as universal as an audience okay. as Water for Elephants did. And I think when we're in our, our marketing and publicity meetings, we're always determining who the targeted audience is for a book. We're like, okay, that's going to reach women ages 40 to 50. Mm -hmm. Or this is going to reach parents with children that have depression or obesity. And in, in fiction, it, it's, it's the same way. We're, we're always narrowing the audience. And with Water for Elephants, we couldn't do that. And I think that was the okay. first time that we had that experience where young men, women, young, old would come to this book, and, uh, and they did. Yeah, they did. So. Okay. so how did you get, um, maybe you've already answered it, but how did you get so many independents to champion and endorse Water for Elephants? And how, did, I mean, how do you get the um, Quail Ridge books to you know, mm -hmm. pop um, you know, events, in-store events? Right. And how does that happen? Well, I think with uh, Water for Elephants, we had uh, the, the independent bookstores around the country, which number maybe 1,200, 1,300, are part of the American Booksellers Association, which is a, a very, very, uh, you know, they, they represent the independents around the country. And they were hosting what they called a Winter Institute Conference out in Long Beach, California. It was the first time that they've done this, mm -hmm. which was three days of workshops where uh, 
staff from all these independent bookstores will go and learn more about staffing, uh, marketing their store, hosting events, and for the publishers who were their partners in this, uh, they were able to bring authors to it. And it was the first time they'd ever done that. And so what we did was we brought Sarah Drill in there. But prior to going there, we sent out a finish or a galley to all the people that were attending Winter Institute. And you know, it's it's hard sending out galleys blindly because they're getting inundated. If you go into the back of Quail Ridge, you'll probably see 300 unread galleys because every publisher is doing this. But I think it was just the right time, the right book, and it seemed that everybody that attended Winter Institute out in Long Beach, which was 500 booksellers strong, by the time they got there, they had read it and they were excited about it. And at that point, it felt like it wasn't in our hands anymore, that the, the bookstores were going to make this the But I, I think how it really started was, you know, Craig, when he read this, realized, oh my God, I can really get a lot of booksellers interested in this. And, you know, he got on the horn and just called every single bookseller that he knows and said, this is one of the most amazing books we've ever had on our list. I really want you to read it. And, you know, none of the other stuff would have happened if it weren't for Craig, you know, doing that and, and his relationships over many years with the bookstore. And his so, credibility. Your credibility. And his credibility. Yeah. Exactly. You know, like E.F. Hutton, would you say? Right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that has to play a part in it, too. Well, I, I, again, I, I think that's the, the beauty of being in publishing is the, the relationships that evolve over time. Yeah. And there's a, a sense of trust. They, they know that I'm not going to try to push something on them that I know that they, they don't want to read. Of course, it's our job you know, from a publicity perspective and a marketing perspective to do that to a certain degree, but at the same time we have to pick our battles. Mm -hmm. And and again, this was, the book made, I think, our job easy. Mm -hmm. And and traditionally, being a house that's been around for 25 years, we had never come across anything like this that had that kind of broad appeal that could be considered literary, which the booksellers want, the media want. They want to think very highbrow of a book. But at the same time, they don't want to admit, geez, maybe it's commercial on the same, oh, right. on the same front. And it was a so. nice, it was a hybrid of the two. It was, right. Yeah. So. And then, uh, then she was able to get on Good Morning America, Today Show, all the, the media, the big media right. outlets pretty fast, too. Yeah. I, I USA think Today. That, that was exciting to, to see. And we had never had that kind of experience when you're getting calls from uh, the, you know, the big uh, Hollywood movie studios uh, fighting for the, the movie rights and... Uh, so I think we initially started out at our sales conference, which was in November, announcing maybe a 20,000 copy mm -hmm. print run, which, and, and a five city tour. And uh, by the time we were ready to launch the book, we put her on a, a 25 city tour, which was a death march. Uh, it was actually a 30 city She tour. actually 30 city. passed out 30 city. Okay. Yeah. She actually passed out in the airport from, you know, because she was working that hard, so. Uh, and in addition to, you know, she wasn't just doing readings at stores. By this point, you know, the book had really caught a lot of buzz and attention. So there was a lot of interviews set up, radio interviews, newspaper interviews. Um, so, I mean, it was really, uh, she had to put in a, a serious effort every single day. And often you have to wake up early to do these radio interviews because a lot of the radio shows are early in the morning. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she really was working you know, from the time she got up until she went to bed while she was out on tour. Where is she from? She's originally from Chicago, but she actually now lives in Asheville. Originally from Canada. Oh, then right. Chicago. Originally from Canada. Yeah. She's, she's a nonfiction writer. When she was right, writing. right. Yeah. This was her first novel. Actually, third novel. Third she novel. had two previous published uh, works of fiction with Harper Collins. And those and were uh, just mass market paperback originals. Um, that did extremely well for her, but she really wanted to publish um, a hardback novel, and her editor, Chuck Adams, saw a lot of promise in this, and um, we decided to bring it out as, as a hardback, which, you know, was kind of risky when, at first, when we didn't know if it was going to be successful or mm -hmm. not. Um, you know, again, we, we had a limited print run that we were initially planning, but, um, you know, fortunately, it turned into a huge success. Great. You all would like to your note card over I can begin sort of filtering through those to hand up to Alice. Yeah. Do we have some available seats? Is there anyone who's standing who doesn't need to stand? There's some seats available. Yeah. 
So, um, so I would assume that Sarah was a very likable person, and uh, you know, she would um, someone who was uh, charismatic. Mm -hmm. um, so that definitely helps mm -hmm. um, with radio interviews and TV mm -hmm. and having having that presence. Um, but what think kind of things can an author do to contribute to the efforts of you know uh, to help your jobs to make your jobs a little easier? Or what kind of things can they do that would not make your jobs easier? <laughs> I think we have a lot of experience. <laughs> on those, those things. You want to start? Um, I think the number one thing that authors can do to make our jobs easier is to um, get your name out there as much as you can. Um, if there are authors who have published stories in literary journals, who um, are reviewing books for, for various newspapers, um, who are publishing op-eds, who have um, an active website with an active blog, just if you can come to us with a platform, mm -hmm. it helps us enormously. That doesn't mean that, you know, if an author comes to us and they, they haven't published much other stuff that we can't make their book successful, but it makes it a lot easier because the more that you publish, the more relationships you establish with, with people in the media. Um, if you're writing for, let's say, the News and Observer doing book reviews for them, you're probably going to get to know a few people, you know, the book review editor at the newspaper, but some other people as well, and you start to build a, a community of, um, of relationships that's very helpful. Um, another thing is now with, uh, with all of the um, you know, social media that we have at our disposal, there's a lot you can do to build an online presence. Um, again, with a website and a blog, um, Facebook is, as you probably all know, immensely popular. Um, Twitter is, is gaining in huge popularity by the day. Um, there's actually one of our authors, her name is Amy Stewart. Um, we're gonna sh we can show you some of her materials. Um, she's publishing her fourth book with us uh, this May, uh, May 21st. And um, if you get a chance, check out her website. It's just amystewart.com. Um, she is uh, one of the best authors I've ever worked with. This is, will be the fourth book I've worked with her on. And um, she just really understands how the author, publicist, or author, publisher relationship works. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, when she published her first book, she was not really that well known of a writer, but she said, I, you know, I'm in this for the long haul and I really want to establish a writing career. And she knew that in order to do that, part of it was going to be to, it's not just about writing books, but it's also about getting your name out there in magazines, newspapers, et cetera. And so she started pitching uh, magazine article ideas and newspaper article ideas to various journalists. And she would come to me and say, hey, I've got this idea. Um, can you give me contacts at um, you know, Martha Stewart Living Magazine or the New York Times uh, home section? And I would give her those contacts. And she would contact them not, not to get publicity for her book, but to pitch her article idea. And now, four books later, she's, um, you know, she, her name is out there. She's published in a lot of magazines, a lot of newspapers, and she's building a, a pretty large uh, fan base. Um, but I think her website shows that um, she does a really smart job of um, working with her website. You'll see that she has her own personal blog on there. She also started a group blog with um, a group of three other gardening writers from around the country. She's a gardening writer. All four of her books have been gardening books. And um, it's she's just knows how to do all of that in a really smart way. And it may be helpful for you to take a look at that site. Okay. Is it Stuart, S-T? S-T-E-W-A-R-T. Okay. And if you understand, when we start to put a, a list together. We publish two lists a year, a fall list and a spring list. We go to our sales conference where we bring in our entire sales force from around the country that sells to the bookstores. And we've got to set these books apart. We have to set these authors apart. And so they want to know what makes this author special. And we can't say, well, she's a grandmother of two and she has a beach house at sunset. Uh, they, they want to see that there's some kind of track record already and at, at the same time that there's a commitment that it's not a one-off book necessarily. With Amy Stewart, we knew we had an author that uh, we were going to build a career with and that they had more than one book in them. And I think a lot of publishing houses can't take those kind of risks today of 
publishing one-off books. They, they need an author that comes with a, a platform. And for our reps to be able to go into a store and, and sell it like that. Well, someone like Amy, who is a hard worker, who knows the system, who is very mm -hmm. proactive, it doesn't sound like they would, those kind of authors are real common, though. They're, I think they're, they're, uh, they're getting very savvy today. They're, okay. they're, authors Good. are getting more and more savvy, especially when it comes to social media. You know, they, they're realizing, because they've heard and read in many places, you know, there are things that you can do on your own online to, to get your name out there and your writing out there and to establish communities, not only connections, not only with your local community, but throughout the country internationally. Um, and, it, you know, it's just a way to network with other people. And to follow up, there's a lot of um, bloggers out there or um, a lot of online book reviews. Mm -hmm. Do you corral any of those um, book reviews in a way um, <coughs> so that you could collaborate between the, um, what's going on, what the conversation that's going on on the web for, some, for a book that you're promoting? Um, we definitely do um, reach out to, to bloggers, and there are some who are, you know, very well known, extremely popular, and then there are some who are not as well known. Um, right now, as I'm sure you've all heard, um, you know, newspapers are folding, um, book review editors are getting kicked out, so the, the publicity opportunities in traditional media are shrinking, but at the same time, the publicity um, possibilities online are growing at an exponential rate mm -hmm. um, and as time goes on we're reaching out more and more to to bloggers um, we have you know there have been some online sites um, salon.com is one I can think of that's been around since the like mid 90s or late 90s I think and is is very well established and we've we've always sent galleys and books to them and pitched to them um, and you know there are there are more websites and more blogs being created every day, and um, we do we do reach out to them. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, and I'm curious. Um, do you decide to put more money behind some books rather than others? Yes, I think definitely. Okay. Um, it's you know <laughs> back in the, I think back when Algonquin first started, it was a, a very level playing field, but. Uh, it, you know, business doesn't work that way and profits don't work mm -hmm. that way. And in a lot of ways, we, we shift. Uh, sometimes we can identify the book that we want to run with at the beginning of the season. And we had that happen uh, last fall. Uh, we had a, what we thought was a very strong novel, and we still do. The reviews were great and everything. But halfway through the selling season, we saw another novel start taking off in a very big way. And so, we had to be very reactionary in that sense and say, let's shift over, let's put more time into that book, let's get the author out there for a few more dates. Um, I think Michael was garnering more publicity, and so you have to make those shifts. So uh, it, it's not a level playing field, I, I think. And it's not necessarily, at least at Algonquin, based on how much we pay for a novel or a book. Um, going, okay, well, we paid 50000 or or 100000 for mm -hmm. that. That should get the most marketing. Because I think once we sit down from a publicity and marketing perspective and go, what are the hooks and the handles? What's the, uh, you know, how's the author going to be in front of a national television <coughs> audience? How are the booksellers going to react to this? And so I think that's how we, we determine in many ways what we can run with. But there's no money to put behind any book, so I don't know. <laughs> so in a way, um, do you pre-screen authors? Because I would assume some authors would be more marketable than... I wish we'd screen... <laughs> I won't say that. Um, <laughs> why did you get this author? Um, because, uh, you know, the other part of the, your question was asking, what don't you want authors to do? And yeah. I think the first thing we always say is, don't ask, why am I not on Oprah? Uh, <laughs> I, I, why am I not on the front page of the New York Times book review? And it's just like, oh, or why am I not on a 30-city tour? Uh, and, and it just doesn't work that way. I mean, we have relationships, great relationships with the New York Times and the producers at Oprah. Uh, but, you know, it's the same reason why am I not on the front table of Barnes & Noble uh, or, or the, you know, on the home page of Amazon.com. It doesn't work that way. And so the more the 
the authors understand we are trying to be the best advocates for the book as we possibly can. But the reality is when we have friends that work at all the big houses in New York and we're all trying to vie for the same mm -hmm. audience and our galleys are going to the same media people and the same booksellers, you know, something's going to bubble up and something's going to, you know, float down to the middle. So. Tell me about one that did bubble up, Last Child in the Woods. Uh, la you know, Last Child in the Woods was, I, I think, if you're not familiar with this book, uh, just to give you a, a quick take on this, it's a, a very strong nonfiction book. Uh, and the subject is basically, if you guys remember growing up, going outside, and your parents had no idea where you were. You were in the woods, you were playing in the creek, you had no cell phones, you were gone on your bike all day long with your friends. <laughs> kids today aren't going outside. The parents are worried about their kids getting Lyme disease, child abduction, uh, melanoma, whatever it is, and they're, they're staying inside. And as a result, we're seeing a rise in obesity, attention deficit disorder, lack of creativity. Even on a, in, in the schools, they're cutting back on recesses right. now. And what Richard Louv did here was take a, 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 a subject, which he called nature deficit disorder, and mm -hmm. showed what, what is happening to our children as a result? And if you take a look at childhood abductions, as he shows in the book, they haven't increased in 30 years. But thanks to Fox News and uh, what's her name with the, the big hair on that? Where, thank you. Yes, thanks to Nancy Grace, we're all scared to put our kids out there. And, uh, you know, and I think the great thing about that book was it was subject driven. But Michael and I were talking about it. It was nostalgic as well okay. because when you bring that up, people are like, you're right. Yeah. I remember my parents had no idea where we were until mom was screaming at six in the evening <laughs> to get home. And we'd come home sloppy with you know, bug bites all over us and that just doesn't happen. So he wrote, and I think that was the great thing about this work, is nobody had tackled that subject. And it was a subject that in a lot of ways uh, reaches grandparents, it reaches parents, and then groups like the Audubon Society. Mm -hmm. What was amazing was to watch actually state legislator, like Connecticut was the first state to enact the No Child Left Inside program <laughs> based, <laughs> on, based on this book. And it's, it's now been adopted in over um, 30 cities around the country, right. and it, it continues to grow. Right, so it was, it was wonderful to see this because I think Michael and I recognized when we read the manuscript, first it was an atypical book for Algonquin mm -hmm. uh, to be so subject driven and there had been nothing done like it before. Uh, so we knew we had off the book page potential and I think, do you want to mention what off the book page potential is? Um, off the book page means anywhere outside of the book review section. Um, sometimes you'll see a, a book covered in um, you know, the, the outdoor section of a newspaper or in the lifestyle section or something like that. So essentially anything outside of, of the book reviews area. And I think that's what we saw with Richard Louv. It wasn't being buried in the New York Times book review, but we saw a full page piece in the science and health section, full page uh, top to bottom article on nature deficit disorder and Richard Louv. And that was what was incredible, and that's, I think, especially if you're a nonfiction writer, how are you going to get off the book page? How does your subject get off the book page? And we had never seen that before. In fact, the book probably garnered more publicity than any book in the 25th history year of Algonquin, and it still continues today. Uh, anytime you read about the lack of visitors at national parks, uh, across the country, boom, Richard Louv is quoted there and he's talking about how the kids are so hardwired on iPods and playing Wii and sitting in front of the TV eating Cheetos, watching Hannah Montana when they're, you know, they should be outside playing. And uh, so he's become an actual spokesperson. And um, I guess it was about six months ago he actually won the National Audubon Medal, which was uh, a, a big deal for him, but also Algonquin, because it, it included people like Jimmy Carter and Robert Redford and Walt Disney and our author, which was pretty exciting. Yeah, and we got um, so much publicity for this book um, just right away, right off the bat. I mean, there was a huge feature in People Magazine. There was a feature in USA Today. He was on um, the early show. He was on CBS Evening News. Um, the Associated Press did a huge feature on him that just ran in 
over 100 newspapers around the country, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. And what's really cool is that the book, um, as Craig mentioned earlier, it really did launch a national movement, and he started getting so many speaking requests that he now has a speaking agent. He's booked for speaking uh, engagements for the next three years. Uh, they formed an organization called the Children in Nature Network, which has four full-time employees, and he has another person who speaks on his behalf, who is the co-director of the Children in Nature Network, who's also booked up through about the next year or so. Mm -hmm. And um, I have Google alerts out on, on his name and his book, and just every single day he's being quoted somewhere <coughs> in, in the media. So it really... Um, you know, it's really rewarding to see that we published a book like this that has had such a, a really big impact. And, um, you know, I think a large part of it was because we did notice that mm -hmm. there was so much potential in this book mm -hmm. that we could really run with it. I, I think the booksellers and media all responded because they, they could relate to it personally. And mm -hmm. that, I think that's the amazing thing is when you can take a hard-driven subject and relate to it personally, and it had that cast of a wide audience. I, yeah. I think that worked tremendously well. One of the things that, we, you know, we obviously putting together a book, we go through numerous amounts of fights in our office about what the jacket should look like and what the subtitle should be and what the title should be. And uh, one of the things that he did not want, uh, Richard Lube on the cover, was nature deficit disorder. It was a phrase that he had coined. Mm -hmm. But we were like, this is such a strong hook and handle. And we had to fight him tooth and nail to the very end. And we got it on. And that was the hook. I mean, if you Google nature deficit disorder, you think... You'll get over two million hits yeah. for it now. And right. it never existed before, right. before he wrote this book. So, and I, I think uh, when, we, when we brought it out, we, we were not pleased with, because if you take a look at it, and it was like, this looks like a signed reading. <laughs> we were just like, no, no. And, and Michael and I are, are very highly opinionated on jackets. And we were just like, no, no, this just looks like something that's going to sell 5,000 copies. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was the first incarnation. And, uh, but for some reason, people did not mind. They felt, you know, this was such a strong subject and it was so engaging. Uh, but we did bring it out, I guess, a year later in paperback. Mm -hmm. And the paperback has a much more appealing jacket. Uh, in the, and it's also updated. We, ha we put in a, a discussion guide and sort of engaging your community, engaging your children. So again, we were able to add a lot of bells and whistles to when we relaunched it in paperback. So, big difference, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So what determines whether a book is published in hardcover or softcover? Well now, that's a really interesting question because um, because of the economy, a lot of people aren't buying books in hardback yeah. and we're, a lot of publishers are now publishing in um, what's called trade paperback original format, mm -hmm. um, which, yeah is actually, I, I think, is very smart in some cases. Um, it can lead to much bigger sales. Typically, people who are younger won't buy hardbacks. They'll wait till it comes out in paperback. Um, but so now we're, we, we have to take that into account. And I think it's going to be a continuing trend that more and more people will publish, more and more publishers will publish trade paperback originals. Um, it kind of depends on. Um, on the audience for the book, mm -hmm. and also um, you have to consider how many copies do we think we can sell of this in, in hardback, um, and then we can have a year later the book come out in paperback and have a whole new opportunity with it. Um, any of our big authors, um, Julia Alvarez for example, um, we will always publish her books in hardback because she has a huge audience and we know that she has a big fan base and a lot of people will buy those hardbacks. Um, and then newer writers were doing more and more as trade paperback originals, but it still is maybe a third of our list mm -hmm. or so, would you say, mm -hmm. yeah. as trade paperback, paperback original? Mm -hmm. There's another question. Um, how important is the marketing or publicity and or publicity of a book um, for its overall success in the marketplace? We were, we were talking about this earlier, and I, I think We've experienced ourselves and we've watched our friends at other houses experience. Um, 
everything has to fall perfectly into place uh, when, when publishing a book. And, and that, believe it or not, I, I think is, is very, very rare. Um, we, I've seen books that have had an enormous amount of money being put in terms of advertising into it. And I've seen their ads in the New Yorker and the New York Times. Mm -hmm. But when I go to talk to a bookseller and say, have you read this? And they're like, uh, actually haven't even heard of it. And, or that they're publicity driven, that the, the reviews are all over the place. But again, the booksellers don't know about it. And so I think one of the, the you know, the problems we have, or the, not really a problem, but uh, one of the things that we try to accomplish is make sure that we're all pointing in the same direction. Uh, what Michael does, I can feed off of from a marketing perspective. If, he, if he's starting to accrue a lot of publicity, I can then share that with the booksellers and say, hey, you might want to check out what's going to happen in three months from now or two months from now, because we've got the author on NPR, uh, slated for All Things Considered, or vice versa. We, we saw that with Water for Elephants, I think that uh, with a novel, especially a, a third novel, it's very hard to get publicity. But all of a sudden, you had all these booksellers talking, which made it easy for, easier for Michael to get the, the media on board. So it's incredibly important because as you, as you can see, the books, I think, would just sit on the shelves. Mm -hmm. But if you guys listen to NPR's Morning Edition, and it's amazing to just watch what happens to a book after an author appears on Morning Edition. It's like, boom, it pops. So, um, Also, I mean, part of it is um, it really just depends on luck. I mean, you can have a, a very successful marketing campaign, a very successful publicity campaign with a lot of results, and it just depends on, on what else is, is out there at the time. Um, you know, and there are times when, also when, I could get a lot of publicity for a book and you know the sales just aren't there. Mm -hmm. Other times we didn't get much publicity but the book is selling like crazy or it's doing, you know, respectably well. So mm -hmm. it is important but it's not, you know, if you're not getting a lot of publicity or if you don't have a huge marketing campaign or advertising campaign, it doesn't mean that your book won't succeed. Mm -hmm. What about book clubs? How have they helped your job? Well, well, your your question about hardback versus paperback, uh, that's that's another reason that there's so much opportunity with paperback. I think with hardback, we have a three to four month window to make it or break it. If that book isn't moving, mm -hmm. publicity wise, through bookseller enthusiasm, through the efforts of the author, it's dead. It's done and it's over with. Uh, whereas with a paperback, a paperback can stay on a shelf of a bookstore for two or three years and have a slow growth. And we saw that with, uh, I think it was The Red Tent, if you guys are familiar with that book. By Anita Diamond. Right. That, that was uh, just amazing to see what she was able to do with that book in book clubs. And I think she was one of the first to really show that, you know, people had not read that really in hardcover. And I think the same with Memory Keeper's Daughter. Mm -hmm. Memory Keeper's Daughter, I think, sold 30,000 copies in hardcover. Mm -hmm. But in paperback, the book clubs just embraced it in an amazing way. And I think they've become a very, very powerful influence. And so you're actually seeing, uh, I think when editors present books, they're, they'll say, take a look at the book club potential with this. And, um, and, and you see that. We have a, a book now uh, called Mudbound by Hillary Jordan, which is just an amazing book set in Mississippi. Uh, post-World War II dealing with racism and it's told from seven narrators. We brought it out in hardcover. Um, Michael had great success with getting the author on NPR's Morning Edition. It came with a tremendous em endorsement from Barbara Kingsolver and we had her out there for about 20 cities on tour. But And, and the reviews all came in and the payoff isn't for us in the hardcover. You know, we'll sell 30, 35,000 copies in hardcover and it's hard to break even. We're looking sort of for that long view approach to hope that we can sell 100 to 200,000 copies of it in paper and that the book clubs will embrace it. So. I think we actually did more like a 30 city tour for, for Hillary Jordan. Um, uh, Christina, um, a publicist I work with, is in the audience and letting me know that it's, <laughs> it was more than 20. Um, 
But that certainly helped a lot too, that, that huge tour. Christina got a lot of media for her while she was out on the road and we got a lot of national media for her as well. And one of the things we're doing with Mudbound, and, and just to show how important the book clubs are, is we just announced a program, I guess about a month ago, where we were offering 100 independent bookstores around the country, one set of Hillary Jordan's Mudbound for a book club that agreed to read it. And so we're... And one, one set is 12 copies. Right, right 12 copies. So we're, we're at that point to where we're willing to give 1,000 copies, 1,000 plus copies away of this book to book clubs because we know the viral, how, how viral these book clubs are. And we also feel that that book has that kind of book club potential. So we're confident in that sense that it might not happen in a month or two months, but we hope to see you know, those kind of, <coughs> kind of sales uh, down the road. And how do you get the word out that office Well, see, that one is, again, we specifically work, uh, in, in this case, through the independent bookstores. And like I said, for us, uh, they work with us. They're, they're almost like employees, and we all sort of work together because they, we, we want them to benefit from the sales of the book club as well. And we don't sell books direct to customers. And so for us, you know, the, the bookstore gives a set away to a book club that agrees it, but Quail Ridge benefits because we hope six more book clubs will come in and buy the book from, from Nancy here at, at Quail Ridge. And so uh, we watch out for each other in, in that sense. And a side note, they're having um, at Quail Ridge the book club bash is Monday night, uh, the 23rd at 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And they're having another one Wednesday the 25th at 10 o'clock. So there will be some Algonquin titles, I'm sure, on the recommended list. I hope so. I, Fill out. Can I ask a question? Please? Sure. This may not be the best way to phrase it, but what do you do with such pedestrian or low-brow venues like Costco? Mm -hmm. They send out every month mm -hmm. a sort of magazine or a mm -hmm. catalog, right. and in it they have a section of books that are coming mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. and the book uh, editor does right. a little blurb on various books. Right. In fact, I think they carried Water for Ella. They did. They did. Do you do anything? We, we do, um, Penny is the, the buyer at Costco and she's based out in Seattle and Penny, uh, again, you know, our relationship with the booksellers uh, spans the boards. You know, we have relationships with Barnes and Noble and Costco and, and the Targets. For a small house like Algonquin, you know, we don't see our books in those kind of venues very much. But I know Penny personally and I also know that Penny likes a certain particular type of book. She likes intrigue, she likes literary thrillers, usually set uh, historically. And so I know what you know, Penny will read. I won't send her everything, but uh, for instance, we have a, a great novel out now called A Reliable Wife that's just hitting the bookstores now. And I knew it was right up her alley because it takes place in Wisconsin in 1907 during the, you know, they're socked in by snow and it's uh, the story of a a well-to-do businessman who's taken an ad out in a Chicago paper for a reliable wife and the woman who shows up has her own ulterior motives and but then he also has his ulterior motives and it, it reads like Wuthering Heights to a certain degree I was Sounds like good. gosh this, this this is something for Penny and 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 the bookstores across the country have embraced this it's now going to be the number one indie bound pick for April, and IndieBound is the 1,200 independent bookstores determine what they think is the best book that they want to promote, and they vote on it. And uh, the the independents said, "This is the one we want to get behind." So, but to answer your question, uh, and and they're, they're readers all over. Um, if it's Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, I think we're all in this business uh, because we we love books, and we we need to sell books. But at the same time, uh, the buyer at Costco is a book lover, just like uh, the buyer here at Quail Ridge. So. Name two of your biggest challenges in the field. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges for me right now is, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, publicity opportunities. Um, in traditional media are decreasing. And it's not just with some newspapers folding and, and some book editors being let go, but 
for example, Entertainment Weekly um, used to have three or four full pages of book reviews. Um, it was a really smart book reviews. Um, and they now do like maybe four to six book reviews an issue um, because of space restrictions. Uh, People Magazine actually, surprisingly enough, has a really good book review section as well. And they had to cut back on their space. Um, so that's one big challenge. Another big challenge is just the competition with other books, um, with other houses. Um, there are so many books being published. A book review editor will get typically, say at the New York Times Book Review, 300 to 500 books a week. And you know, it's really you know, less than 5% of those books that, that they're going to be able to, to cover. Um, so those are the challenges, but you know, we always look at it in an optimistic way because every book that we're publishing, we, you know, we really believe in and we feel like um, you know, there's, you know, we've got to give it our, our best effort. Um, and just to go back to your question about the, the marketing thing, how do we si decide which books to give yeah. money to, um, you know, at a minimum, we're always spending money on galleys. And um, galleys are the kind of uh, advanced copies of books that we send out to media and booksellers um, about five or six months before the, um, the pub date. These actually cost more to produce than the actual book does. These cost about eight dollars to produce, and the books are like two dollars. A dollar twenty-five, depending on the print run. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're putting a lot of money into these, and we send out a lot of them, and we, you know, we we contact a lot of people to kind of sow the seeds, and um, so there there is a lot of money and effort we're putting into each book. Mm -hmm. It's just sometimes we don't have enough money to put into, you know, an advertising campaign or, mm -hmm. you know, the extra stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, I think too, I think we've we're, we're a very galley happy company. We'll print out maybe a thousand galleys of a title, and uh, that's usually not done at the other larger houses. They can throw together a New York Times ad, but we feel that we can get the the galleys into the right media hands and the right bookseller hands, and so we do more of the sort of the guerrilla marketing and publicity in that sense. And uh, I think we get more bang from our buck in, in that sense because I personally I've never bought a book based on an ad. It's based on most of the time somebody recommending the book to me or hearing the author on uh, national public radio. Yeah. Uh, or a friend at another house, but uh, you know, it, it, an ad in the New York Times book review that's going to run forty thousand yeah. uh, dollars, and I just <laughs> think, geez, that's two new cars for Michael and I. <laughs> 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 and, and granted, we have done full-page ads uh, for for Sarah Gruen's book, but it did not happen at the very beginning. Uh, once we hit a certain mark and we were launching the paperback. We knew we had the money to put into that, and we knew we were going to get the money back. So, we we wow. put together you know full page ads that ran in the New York Times and ads that ran in USA Today, and uh, you know there, there's an expectation I think in the industry more than anything that oh you have to run an ad in the New York Times to show who you are or who the author is, but you know that that sometimes doesn't move the needle. Again, I think it's. Uh, uh, collaboration of everything coming together perfectly. Convergence. Yes, and uh, again, that's very hard to do. So, I've got a question here. Um, how do you find a reputable publicist to market a short story collection? Um, that's a really good question. Um, there are a lot of freelance publicists out there, um, and there is um, a blog called the Book Publicity Blog. It's run by a woman named um, Yen Chang, uh, who works for Penguin. She's a really great publicist. And um, it's something that you might all want to check out if you're interested in, in publicity and hearing viewpoints from you know, somebody who's worked in the industry for a long time. She offers a lot of, of great advice to, to authors and to other publicists. Um, she has put together a list of um, freelance publicists, um, and I think it's about like 15 or 20 people long. And these are all people who are professional publicists, and um, as far as I know, it's, it's the most reputable list out there. Um, 
You can also find, you know, if you're looking for somebody locally, um, there are freelance publicists that work locally. There are those who work just with books. There are those who work with books and other material. Um, but I would say start with, start with that um, blog, the book publicity blog. Great. We have another question here. Um, what free internet services are useful to market and publicize books? Free. Yeah. Um. I was thinking more along the lines of be social media. But. Yeah, I mean, Facebook is free, Twitter is free. You can set up a blog for free on um, Blogger or WordPress. Um, those are just two out of many. Um, and also, if again, going back to that uh, book publicity blog, she covers a lot of those topics too. So if you, if you go through the archives, you'll really find a wealth of information in there. Um, but you can basically get, do all of that stuff for free now. Okay. And uh, if you don't have the time, you may have to hire someone to do the social media stuff. It's yeah, very I mean, intense, it's very time intense. It is very, it's, it can be time consuming. And if you're working a full time job and you're writing, it can seem, you know, pretty daunting to, you know, oh, now I have to do this blog and this other stuff on top of it. And you can hire somebody to, to handle that for you or work with you on that. There's a lot of college students here available that would probably <laughs> avail themselves. Um, how, here's another question. How would a person with a disability um, and unable to tour or maybe not be able to tour as um, intensively as, as Sarah did um, be able to be a successful author? You know, we actually had an author on our, our past list who was uh, uh, in a wheelchair and she could not tour. And, and you know, I. I there's a, I think, and, and Christina knows this, uh, having set up these tours, tours are very time consuming to set up because, it, you know, to call the bookstore and work with their schedule and then call another bookstore and logistically get them from right. place to place and then go to that bookstore and there might be two people there and those two people both have manuscripts that want to be published and they're only showing up. <laughs> and, and so the, the realities of the, the tours Tours have gotten very difficult uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, again, I think it's a, when you were talking about what our biggest challenges are, is getting people to actually read and, 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 and take the time. Because especially during, uh, I, don't, I don't know why we're here tonight when March Madness is taking place and who plays it now. But there, there are so many things that, that can take away from our time. And it's the iPod and, and my wife, who was never on a computer, I don't talk to her anymore. Uh, she was a pretty voracious reader, but she's like, I got another email. And, and so, and I think that's made it very difficult for touring as well, for people to really come out, uh, especially if you aren't a well-known writer. Um, you know, we'll put Hillary Jordan out, and Hillary was getting all kinds of great media, but Hillary will be the first to admit that she went to a few of those stores and nobody was there and she just ended up chatting with the booksellers. It's the worst feeling. And, and it is the worst feeling, but at the same time, those booksellers had the opportunity to meet her and we're looking about the down the road. It's, it's a losing right. proposition because I think 10 years ago, the, the figure was $1,000 per city. And if you think about it, we're selling the books to a bookseller at 50% off. And if they're only buying 25 books and they're only selling three books, uh, it's a losing proposition. And that's why we feel that there are many different ways to promote a book than a book tour. The, I think the book tour days uh, are not numbered, but people just aren't as uh, tour happy. Other houses aren't as tour happy to, to put authors on. On big tours. So, if you had a disability, it, it wouldn't. I would say no. you just you'd be savvy in other areas like social media. I, yeah. so. Well, you can also um, there are um, blog book tours that you can do. Right. Um, this is another thing that that website I mentioned earlier addresses, um, and you can also do um, uh, you know you can meet with book clubs via the telephone, which mm -hmm. is something that a lot of authors do, um, and it's it's really smart if you have a bookstore or a group of people or a book club that's interested, um, you can participate in their book club by calling in and talking to them for an hour. And um, it actually has really good success. Um, there's an author named Kate Jacobs who wrote a book called The Friday Night Knitting Club, which is a huge bestseller right now. And I don't know if it was 
the New York Times or, or some place did an article on, on how she's doing this, participating in all of these book clubs over the phone. And um, she's been, you know, she does like, she's done like 30 in the, in the past couple months. Um, so there are other possibilities other than physically doing the tour. I think I participated in, it was Press 53 and they had a, um, it was a chat. With, um, the, with the author, so we didn't have to be on voice. You could just chat away and get yeah. the answers. Yeah, I think I still have a response that's on Google that I, from that chat. <laughs> it's like, oh, that was a long time ago. Here's another question. Um, can you talk about the commercial viability of humor on today's market, and is there any? Yeah, I mean, we... Do we have a guy named, uh, he's from Raleigh originally, um, David Sedaris? I think he does really well. I heard his book sell. Uh, uh, so we published um, a book in trade paperback original by this guy Dan Kennedy called Rock On. It's a very hilarious memoir about him working for um, a corporate record label. Um, he thought he had hit the big time, and it turned out to be one of the most miserable experiences of his life. He lasted about a year. It's a very funny book, and. Um, William Alexander did a book with us called The $64 Tomato, um, which is about him deciding to do his own um, gardening and make his own tomatoes. And he realized, he, he did a cost breakdown, and he realized he had spent about $64 per tomato doing that. And um, both those books were extremely successful for us. I mean, we got a ton of, of um, media for them. They sold really well. The booksellers were really excited about them. So, uh, you know, I think there's definite. I think people want yeah. to laugh, yeah. especially in these hard and, times. And it allows us, from a publicity and marketing perspective, to have fun with marketing the book. With, with Dan right. Kennedy, we actually had a bookseller power ballot contest where books, booksellers can actually write their own power ballot about working in a bookstore. And, and they were so bad. But actually, one bookseller out in California went into a studio and recorded the song. Wow. And it was so well done. And it was something that all the bookstores could relate to. But we were able to have fun in, in that sense. And so humor, you know, humor books in a lot of ways, from the packaging of them to the way we promote them. And uh, you know, it just gives us a little more opportunity to have fun with the book and, and think outside the box in terms of uh, the way we market and promote the book. Um, this is actually my last question on the index card. So after this question, I'm going to open it up to the audience, and we have 15 minutes left, so I think we're on a good, good track of time. This question is, what was the transition like from moving to a regional independent publishing <coughs> house to being part of a larger corporate structure? And how was much of the original um, autonomy was retained? So you were all part of that. Mm -hmm. You've been, right. um, you know, between the two of you, you have 30 years experience. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think Craig can speak to this more, but um, I do think it's important to note that our parent company, Workman, is the largest independent publishing company in the country. It's a family company that is still run by the same guy who founded it 35 years ago. Um, it's not, you know, it does not feel um, super corporate. It's um, it's really intimate, and we work extremely closely with each other. So, um, you know, we have friends that work at other houses like Simon and Schuster, and mm -hmm. you know, Random House. And I think, um, you know, there's there's a difference in in the way that a you know a publisher who's owned by some huge mega company in Germany, you know, is run as opposed to a company that's run that's still truly an independent company. I don't think we see the uh, the the turnover at, at that you would see at the other houses. That, you know, I, I think it's because we both signed thirty-year contracts. <laughs> but, uh, but but at the same time, that when when we go up to the New York office, these are people that we've we've grown up with. Uh, Peter Workman and his wife and uh, the staff there, and that makes it feel you know, very very unique. As, as going from a, a regional house. Um, we were still a regional house. When Workman purchased us probably about 18 years ago, and he's allowed us to have a lot of autonomy and, and to continue our vision as Algonquin. But there has been a big shift. Um, when I first started with Algonquin, we were a regional house. We published Jill McCorkle and Clyde Edgerton and Larry Brown, and all of our writers had some kind of 
uh, separation from Louis Rubin, the founder, by maybe one degree, and that was it. And our relationships, most of where we sold our books and got our books promoted, was in the South. However, in, in the, the last few years, we've watched two things. One is the homogenization, I think, of the South to where you don't see uh, the, the, the grasp that Southern readers have on Southern writers. You know, we were known as the Southern House, and all the writers, uh, the Southern writers seem to be affiliated with Algonquin. Now Southern writers are published with every house, and at the same time, the bookstores have changed. They, they might have a Southern section, but they're promoting the books that are being promoted in the Midwest as well. But our writers are now coming from all over the world. And I think our relationships with the media and the booksellers have evolved to where you know, some of our closest friends in the bookselling business are in Northern California and Portland and Seattle, uh, just as much as they are here in Raleigh and Durham and uh, Jackson, Mississippi. So it, it's been fun to watch this evolution of being a, a small house. But we, we still consider ourselves a, a small house. And when we need to, we put on that southern accent. When, uh, <laughs> you know, we have Jill McCorkle's new collection. J Jill hasn't written anything in nine years. And she's coming back in the fall. And we're very, very excited with uh, this collection. And, uh, you know, but our job now is not to just channel this in the south, because we see that this, this is not just southern in that sense and we're not a southern house so we hope that it's embraced by the media all over the country as well as books booksellers all over the country so. Great. okay i'm going to open it up to questions um do you have um any free advice for, for those writers who, who have published through print on demand or small presses other than some of the things you talked about tonight with social networking and, and Are you, is your goal to um, try to get published with, uh, with a publishing company? Yes, but um, for the, for, uh, while I'm doing that, I, I also have, have um, released my own book through Print On Demand. Right. And, and uh, going through kind of slowly the process of, of like you said, getting, just mainly getting my name out. Right. And uh, getting some word of mouth. And, and I've been very successful with Facebook so far. But uh -huh. I was wondering, are there other things that I could, could do in addition to that? Or how do I build on what I've done so far um, in order to approach other, other uh, either booksellers or publishing right. houses or right. Well, I, you know, w one thing that, that surprises me all the time is, and I hear this from writers like Sarah Gruen and I, I believe Brock Clark, um, that they actually have a, a small group of, of writing friends to where they meet and they are very critical of each other's works. They, they share the work and, you know, it's easy for uh, a relative to go, oh, that's wonderful. This should be a book, you know, and, and, and we've all had that. This needs to be published. But to actually have a, a group of people that are writers that are trying to get to where you're trying to get to become a successful published writer, to actually share your manuscript with, take the criticism and the, you know, the constructive criticism and rework and rework and, and help them out. And in a lot of ways, you can't do this on your own. And, and Sarah Gruen has a group like that of, I believe, four, four friends. And they're all published writers now. But <clears throat> I, I, I've heard so many times writers start with this group that they can work with and tighten up and tighten up the manuscript. Because the last thing I think a publishing house wants to do is see a book that really needs a lot of work. They want to be able to feel like, somebody's helped do a lot of that edi editorial work from the very beginning. Um, well, I'm, I'm actually past that. So, okay. You know, I've, I've had worked with writing groups right. and, and gotten that feedback okay. and revised it a number of times. So, um, so you're, you're wondering, what else can I do, to, can I do to try to get word out about yeah. my book that's been published? Um, I think, um, you know, are there... I mean, I feel like I, it would take a while to sit down with you because I'd want to ask you a lot of questions like, is it fiction or nonfiction? And if it's nonfiction, what's the subject matter? And are there, are there any kind of regional hooks to it or any subject-specific hooks? And, um, 
And then from there, I could go in and, and you know, hit the ground running and go after these different people and, and do a lot of internet searching and find out you know, where, where are these possibilities to market this book and promote this book. Um, I would suggest the possibility of, um, if you can, if you can afford it, um, contacting a publicist maybe just for like a consultation or something so they can meet with you one-on-one -on -one to talk to you about it. Um, again, and I'm, I'm not shilling, I'm not getting paid by this woman who's done this <laughs> blog, the Book Publicity Network, but it, it really is a very valuable website. And if you go in there, there you'll find, I'm willing to bet you'll find one or two or more posts about how to pr promote your book if you're a self-published author. And mm -hmm. another thing is that, you know, you're in good company. A lot of, a lot of people are self-publishing these days, and I think it's going to continue to get more and more popular. Um, so there, you do have a lot of resources at your disposal. If the book can also be pulled apart, just to give you two examples, uh, you know, Sebastian Younger, before he wrote The Perfect Storm, that was an article that appeared in Outside Magazine, and it was a great, great article. And the same with uh, John Krakauer's Into the Wild. They became articles first, and in a lot of ways, again, it allows the publisher to go, this piece has already been appeared in Harper's Magazine or in the Raleigh News and Observer. It was excerpted. So you can pull that book apart. Is there parts that can be excerpted out? Can you pull that? Because just going to a publisher and going, here's my book, it's so much easier to say this appeared in the uh, September issue of Harper's Magazine or the Independent.